decided to follow Jesus. I had decided to follow Him. I had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I'll follow Him. No turning back. I'll follow Him. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, I'll follow Him. Follow, I will follow him. I will follow him. I will follow him. I will follow him. Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. Just a, a question to ask myself and ask you all, why, why are you here this morning? Is it because, to worship, is it, is it because you want to be a good example for your kids or because that's what you're supposed to do and you'll feel bad if you don't? Are we here to follow Jesus? Are we here to worship him? Are we here to put the cross before us and to lift high the name of Jesus? I, I, I hope that's why I'm here. I hope that's why you're here and I'm glad you are here to worship with us this morning. If you are new, there should be a little uh, brochure in the pew back in front of you. We would love for you to take that home with you and uh, see the information that we have and, and how you can get in touch with us. And uh, we'd love for you as well to fill out the visitor card on the back of that and put that in the offering plate as that comes around here in a moment. Or you can put it in the offering boxes there by either of the doors on your way out. Love to have a record of your visit. If you'll uh, open up your bulletins, we'll go through our announcements this month. We have a new verse of the month. We're going to keep on going through Psalm chapter 1. We're in verses 3 and 4 this month. So uh, it says in the Lund uh, Legacy Standard Bible version, uh, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, that's the righteous man, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. And a great reminder for us from the Lord. Um, just another reminder, your contribution records are available in the church office if you need those. Uh, youth, we have our youth book study. This is going to be the first and third Mondays of the month. And that will be, the next one will be tomorrow at 7 p.m. So if you have questions about that, see Joe Schmidt or, or Zephram. And also one thing regarding youth that's not in your bulletin is next Sunday, I guess there's something going on 
um, some match or something. Uh, Super Bowl Sunday will be, they'll have a party at Joe's house. And if you don't have a place to go and you want to hang out, he said that that's uh, open for anybody who wants to come and join the youth there for that next Sunday. Um, Abolition Day is this Tuesday. And so if you are planning to go with us, we're going to leave here at Grace. We'll take the church van at 7 a.m., be on the road then to be there in time, and we'll get back sometime mid-afternoon. Um, so if you are going, please make sure you sign up so I don't leave you um, for that. And then if you're not going, if maybe you aren't able to make it, uh, please remember to contact your, uh, your local representatives. Call them, email them, um, and advocate for the rights of the unborn, that we don't want to legislate and regulate abortion. Uh, we want it completely gone from our nation, and especially here in Oklahoma, where we have more of a voice for that. Since uh, Roe vs. Wade has been overturned, um, abortifacients, so like the morning after pill, those sorts of things, uh, the use of those has gone up exponentially. And so abortion still is happening, and so we want to fight those things. We want to fight it with the gospel, and so we want to protect all life there. So if you can come, please sign up for that. If not, uh, be in prayer and contact your representatives. Uh, our Acts 1-8, that's our missions team, will be meeting. Uh, it's the first Tuesday of every month, so the next one will be this Tuesday at 7 p.m. If you have questions about that, you can contact Joe Schmidt. Ladies, there's a make it and take it night. And so uh, they'll be doing a beginner's course on making jelly on February 16th. So uh, please make sure you sign up. There's the registration link there. Uh, you have to sign up by February 9th. If you didn't sign up, they're not going to have enough materials for you to participate, so please make sure you sign up for that. Uh, there's also going to be a, ba- a baby shower for uh, Bo and Chelsea Bethard on February 19th at the Murray's house, our house, at 2.30, so um, come and join them for that. Uh, guys, the Ironman Summit is our one-day conference at Owasso Bible Church. Who all is going to that? Guys, raise your hands. Who all is planning on going? Awesome. Got a lot going there. Reminder, if you have not registered, Register online by going to the Grace homepage. Scroll down and you'll see a big link that says register for the Ironman Summit. Once you register online, make sure you sign up here in the foyer so we can know how many vans to have for that. Also, some other market calendars. There's a baby shower for Wesley and Madison Rushing. That's going to be on March 5th. Also for our sports camp in June and the Lincoln, Nebraska trip in July. So please be in prayer for those things and prepare for those And also one more thing to prepare for that's not in your bulletin is next Sunday will be when we take communion and we also take up the deacon's benevolence offering. And so we always want to make sure that we remind you of that so that you can prepare your heart to partake of the Lord's Supper as a family. That means you're getting right between you and God, but also between people in this church. That if you have unresolved conflict, don't take the supper. Paul talks about that very clearly. So you've got a week. If you need to get something right with a brother or sister here, do that. And also prayerfully consider how you might be able to give to the Deacon's Benevolence Fund as well. So with that, guys are here, so we'll uh, pray and take up the offering. Uh, Father, we do thank you uh, for this gift that we have to follow you. Help us, Lord, to not take that for granted. Uh, Help us to honor you, uh, to follow you joyfully, and to uh, let our lives be one uh, beautiful song of praise to you as we give of our tithes and our offerings right now as we sing these songs, and as we uh, hear your word preached to us, would you be magnified and honored in our lives? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing to our Savior, who is both strong and kind. Keep 
keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and said that if I fear, I should come to Him. No one else can be my shield. I should come to Him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day.
Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. key. Um, don't mean to quote the spirit. We can start over. <clears throat> but that was going to be way too high to sing. So sorry about that. Yeah. 
stay standing for the Word of God. Ryan will be continuing going through Luke in chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. This is the Word of the Lord. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and then went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father, it is uh, such an honor and such a joy that we can come together because you have brought us together. To, to hear your word, to sing your word, to uh, act out your word in love toward one another. Father, thank you for uh, establishing this church, for establishing and allowing us to be together. Father, I would ask that you would take the words that Ryan has prepared today in this wonderful and sometimes uh, confusing text and uh, let us hear the words of Jesus. And may this day, may we hear them in a way that would allow us to be changed, in a way that we would uh, act toward one another and that we would live our daily lives. Just be with Ryan and put your peace upon him. Fill him with your spirit today, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hopefully I will <clears throat> make it through this. I, uh, <clears throat> my voice is almost shot, and uh, it was hard not to sing. It's like uh, the, the beauty was, it was getting to sit there, the last song, and then just listening to you all belting it out to the Lord of just worshiping our great King. <clears throat> and so um, you can pray for me that uh, the Lord will uphold my voice as long as he wants it to be upheld. All right, there is a great temptation in our day to soften the words of Jesus Christ as well as the demands of the gospel. I I think it's often well-intentioned, but I think it can also be an evidence of cowardice. On the cowardice side of things, we don't want people to be offended by us or to be angry with us. And so we, we just focus on, on God's love and on His forgiveness. No one of us enjoys being rejected by others. We don't want to be hated. And so out of fear, we, we might try to package the message of Jesus in a way that won't upset anybody. But on the well-intentioned side, <clears throat> we want people to be saved. We, we want people to come to Jesus and find Forgiveness, and so I think what we sometimes will end up doing is, is focusing on the enticing aspects of the gospel, uh, trying to remove the, the offense of the message of Jesus. But as we go through the gospel of Luke, we don't find Jesus watering down the truth, or, or even only kind of focusing on the, the comfy truths, just to make people feel feel good, or, or to make it easier to come to him, to be his disciple. Now, as I say that, I think it's important to know that, that Jesus didn't set out to be offensive. In fact, it was quite the opposite, right? 
He came to save people. He came to extend God's mercy into this earth and to bring people into the kingdom of God. And what's important to note is you don't do that, you can't do that with half of the truth. The same gospel that offends some will be salvation to others. And this has always been the way of it. We read this all throughout the Bible. We see it in 1 Corinthians. This isn't up here, but just listen to what Paul said. He said, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, but listen to me, he didn't actually come to bring peace on earth. Well, yet. In fact, he said that. Again, listen to what he said in Matthew 10. He said, Don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. To choose Jesus, to choose to follow him, may very well set you at odds with even your own family, let alone the unbelieving world around us. Jesus did not soften or hide that truth. It wasn't a bait and switch. Let me get him with this, but then I'll really let him know the cost of discipleship. <clears throat> the truth is you, you cannot have this world and just add a little Jesus. He doesn't leave us that option. And I think part of what we have got to wrestle with this morning is, is this question. Is it worth it? Is Really, I guess the question is, is he worth it? To truly trust in and, and follow Jesus is not a half-hearted or lukewarm affair. In fact, many of you could, when I say the word lukewarm, your thoughts go to the book of Revelation, right? And what did Jesus say? Be hot or cold if you're lukewarm. The literal word there is, I vomit you out of my mouth. So, let's continue in our, our study of the Gospel of Luke this morning. And as, as we continue this book, we, we, we should be asking ourselves the question, who is Jesus and is he worth following? The few verses that we're going to meditate upon this morning give us an, another glimpse into the person of Jesus Christ. And I, I love this text because we've got the tender mercy of Jesus on display side by side with the hard facts of what it means to follow him. So as, again, as we go into this text... I think it would be good to, to test ourselves, to check, am I really ready to follow him? And if you're a Christian, I guess the, maybe the better question to ask yourself is, am I following him? Am I really doing it? Or have I become half-hearted and lukewarm? So let's start again with verse 51. We read this. When the days drew near... <clears throat> For him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. All right, Luke has recorded a few times that Jesus knew and taught that he was on his way to Jerusalem to be rejected, killed, and then even raised from the dead. This hadn't sunken into the disciples yet, into their way of thinking, into what they were, their view of Messiah and the kingdom of God. They were ready for the Messiah, for Jesus to, to come and establish the kingdom in victory, to vanquish their enemies, to rule over all of creation. But that was not what the first coming was about. That will take place in the future. Be assured of that. But that was not the purpose of Jesus' earthly ministry during his incarnation. The Son of God was born for a specific reason, so that he could die. That was the purpose of him coming in human flesh. And so here we are in Luke. 
were maybe two, two and a half years into his earthly ministry. And the appointed time of that sacrifice is, is looming near. It's just around the corner. The days are drawing near. And this is a great text here in verse 51. It says, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that picture there is this determined resolution to fulfill his mission. He is going to go there to do what the Father sent him to do. He had said it earlier. If you've got your Bible open, just look back up at verse 22 in chapter 9. He said this, A son of man must suffer many things, must, keyword, must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day, be raised. The whole reason Jesus came was what? Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See that in Mark 10, 45. All right, we hear this, but I think it's so easy for us to take this for granted because we've heard this so many times. We know this story so well, but think about what verse 51 is saying here. Jesus set his face to wrath that was about to fall on himself. He determined to head toward the wrath of God so that the mercy of God could be extended to others. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Really, that's the theme of almost the whole rest of the book. In fact, starting in verse 51, if we go through chapter 19, verse 27, big chunk here, that's the theme of all those chapters. And then you see in the rest of the book, it happens. He's there in Jerusalem. This points us toward Jesus' cross, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. This was going to be incredibly difficult. It was going to bring in a tremendous amount of suffering. But I want you to think about this. For Jesus, this was not a drudgery. But rather, the scripture says it was for a joy. It was for the joy at the end. Not, not the joy of the cross. The cross was miserable. Being forsaken by the Father was going to be agony. But the path to joy was through Jerusalem, through the cross. In fact, let me put Hebrews 12, 2 up here. Many of you have memorized this. But it says this, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the, the other side of the cross was what? It was resurrection and an ascension to enthronement at the Father's right hand. And one of the amazing things about being seated at the Father's right hand, you know what he's doing there right now? He's interceding for us. We see that in Romans 8.34. I'll put that up here. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Did you screw up last week? Anybody, anybody do a perfect week? All of your thoughts were glorifying to the Lord. You pursued him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you raise your hand, we'll give you a moment to repent right now. <laughs> you have an advocate sitting right next to the Father saying, I died for that. My righteousness applied to him, to her. Martin Luther, I love a quote that he had, we'll put it up here, he says this, So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. But see, not only can you, can you claim the blood of Jesus Christ, but because of the blood of Christ, he claims you as his own. He intercedes for you as his. And if you're his, no one can condemn you. There's no condemnation for you. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, so Luke 9.51 really displays Jesus here, just firm resolve resolute determination to head to Jerusalem, to head to the cross on the path to glory. Let's keep going. Look at verses 52 and 53. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. 
All right, now if you've grown up in church, you know that there's some sort of difficulty that goes on between Jews and Samaritans, and maybe you understand it and maybe you don't. But the route to go from northern Galilee down to southern Judea would have normally gone right through the land of Samaria. And a strict Jew wouldn't go through this area at all. In fact, they would cross the Jordan River to the east, travel north or south, depending on which way they're going, and then cut back over to avoid Samaria altogether so that they wouldn't be contaminated um, by you know, being defiled in this pagan area. Now, the, the Samaritans, they were a racially mixed group of partly Jew, partly Gentile people, and they were kind of disdained by everybody. Nobody really thought favorably of them, definitely not the Jews. The Samaritans had their own version of the law of God, they had their own temple on Mount Gerizim, and they even had their own kind of rendering of Israelite history. And tensions ran high between Jews and Samaritans. Uh, in fact, let me, you might be wondering where that comes from, but let me read a passage here. It'll be 2 Kings 17. It should be up here. And we see kind of what happened to, to lead us to this point. 2 Kings 17, 22, 24 says this. The people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. He was the king. They did not depart from them until Yahweh removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. So get the picture there. They've rebelled against God. They've they've worshipped false deities. So God brings them into captivity into a foreign land. Now verse 24. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Seraph. I tried to work on this one earlier, Seph Arvaim, Seph Arvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and lived in those cities. And so what you have is we have this foreign king placing pagans, non-followers of Yahweh, into the land. And these Gentile foreigners intermingled with the Jews that were still there that hadn't been deported. And now this mixed race called the Samaritans are who were formed. Well, of course, what happens when non-Yahweh worshipers come in? They bring their false religion with them. And so we've got this mixture now of false religions and Yahweh worship in the land. Eventually, they abandon their idols and they worship Yahweh, but they kind of did it after their own tweak, their own way a little bit. Okay, so that's the backdrop. That's what Samaritans are, who they are, and that's this village, one of the villages that Jesus is sending his disciples to, to get ready, make preparations for him. The idea there is probably just that they were being sent to get housing ready, food and lodging and all that. Kind of a, as a side note here, and it's important though, is that Luke emphasizes all throughout his gospel that Jesus' ministry, his salvation, is for beyond the Jews. Luke himself is a Gentile, and he's writing the letter to whom? Do you remember? To Theophilus. Theophilus also is a Gentile, a non-Jew. And so one of the things we see all throughout the gospel is that the good news of Jesus is for all ethnic groups. It's for Jew, Gentile, Samaritan. I suppose Cherokees, y'all will make it in two. But all nations will, right? Not only all nations, but all types of people. And we've seen here prostitutes, men, women, children, outcasts demon-possessed, and even despised tax collectors. The kingdom of God is for all. All are invited. All are welcome. All are invited to come to Jesus Christ for eternal life. But here, notice in our verses, what do the Samaritans in this village, at least they do? They reject Jesus. And the text says here, because he set his face toward Jerusalem, and I wrestle with this, I wonder what that meant. I think what it is, is that maybe this was the, the Jew-Samaritan tension. And the last thing that a Samaritan would want to do would be to help a Jew get to Jerusalem. Because we've got Mount Gerizim, our own temple. Why would I help a Jew who hates us and we hate them get to Jerusalem? Well, I I think that this rejection of Jesus here foreshadows more rejection that's going to follow. The people in this village may have rejected him for ethnic pride, but, but Luke here, I think, picks this as a wider pattern Jesus is on a saving mission from God, and whether it's from ignorance or malice, some people refuse to welcome him as their Savior, follow him as Lord. Well, let's, let's look at, and we've seen it already, but let's look again at the disciples' reaction to this affront to their Lord. 
Look at verse 54. <clears throat> and when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? As I was reading this, I would have expected this to be Peter. Just impetuous Peter. Oh, Lord, let's, let's get him. But do you all remember the nickname that Jesus gave James and John? Yeah, sons of thunder. You know, the, oh, these guys are ready to go. But still, when you, you know, even though you know that about them, when, when you read this, you think, what are these guys thinking, really? They want Jesus to call down fire? They want to be able to call down fire? And maybe this is part of their disdain for the Samaritans. Maybe this is coloring their vision. It could also be that they were remembering Elijah. And in this very region, Elijah had done something similar. King Ahaziah of the northern kingdom sent a company of 50 men to arrest the prophet Elijah. Do you remember what Elijah did? He called down fire and consumed him. So the king sent another company of 50 men. Elijah, again, calls down fire and consumes them. And then finally, the third commander comes, and he just falls down before Elijah. Look, please spare me and, and spare my men. And the prophet goes with him, and he pronounces judgment on King Ahaziah. And so here are James and John, and you, could just, I just, you just picture them. How dare these Samaritans snub the Son of God? They have insulted the King of glory. And I, I think James and John, at least I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, I think they spoke out of concern for the honor of Jesus Christ. And they even had biblical precedent. Well, I guess we could say that. But they're in the wrong here. They've got zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. And we'll see that in Jesus' response to them. Look at verses 55 and 56. But he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. That word rebuke means to denounce or to express strong disapproval. Jesus' ministry was not to bring judgment at this time. It was to save. It was to extend the mercy of God. In fact, a few verses that aren't up here, but just listen. John 3.17 says this, For God did... In fact, you all know John 3.16, right? Whoever believes in him have eternal life. But John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Or Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Or John 12.47, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That's a strong word there. I don't think you can get much clearer about the purpose of Jesus than those verses. This ministry, this time, was not the time for wrath. It was a time for mercy to extend that. All right. But before we're too difficult or hard on James and John, let me ask you this question. When someone treats you with disdain, or they intentionally harm you, what is your attitude like toward them? Have you ever wanted to call down God's anger on someone? Or just maybe prayed, Lord, I don't really want you to send them to hell, but just give them what they deserve. I know many Christians, or I've known some Christians at least, who have literally prayed for destruction on their enemies. Think about this text. Were the Samaritans in the wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But James and John were equally wrong in their response. Our calling, like theirs, is not to seek revenge against our enemies or God's enemies. Our calling is to serve our enemies in love. And even asking God to, to temper our harsh edge, the harsh edge of our zeal, with the compassion of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I think is beautiful... <clears throat> is that God did that transforming work in John. You know, you get this picture of John here, you know, the son of thunder wanting to call down the wrath of God, just fire literally to come down and burn him up. And yet, many today would call John, maybe you've heard this, the, the apostle of God's love. Yeah. We know from John's writings that the love of God in Christ became the grand theme of his life and ministry in fact, one thing that's really cool is that later on, I think John will have to prove his love for the Samaritans. He does this in the book of Acts. We find that he and Peter take the gospel to many villages in Samaria. And you can only wonder 
if maybe John visited this very same village that at one time he wanted to call the fire of God down upon. What we do know for certain is this, is that God changed this fighter into a lover. And listen to me, by God's grace, he can do the same thing to you. He can work that same change in your heart. Whenever people arouse your anger, you can ask the Holy Spirit to show them the love of God through you. And let me mention this as well. We, we must never compromise truth or tolerate sin. We are, we are called to show mercy to the lost the same way Jesus did. And, and whenever, though, those who claim to represent Jesus have worked to make temporal judgment, the results are disastrous. Just think about the Inquisition or the Crusades. The execution of the supposed witches in Salem or the persecution of Anabaptists by Reformed and and Catholics alike, those things have been blights on the name of Jesus for ages. As God's people, we need to confront sin and call for repentance, but the final judgment, that's not ours, that's for God. Mercy is at the heart of gospel ministry. And it has to be extended to everyone without regard to race, gender, age, cultural background, or even someone who hates you and hates Jesus. The God who delights in mercy delights in merciful Christians. All right, so we've got the Samaritans here. and They, they refuse to help Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. But there are others, as we see in our text, who had a different response. Others who claimed they wanted to follow him and go with him. And the next few verses teach us a little bit about what it means to follow Jesus. In fact, the word follow is the key word in this next section. All three of these people said they had the intention to follow Jesus, but as we learn more about him, we have to wonder if they really had what it takes to follow him all the way to Jerusalem. And I think that that should lead us to ask ourselves again, are we ready to follow Jesus all the way? So let's look at the first encounter, verses 57 and 58. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I want to ask you a question. If someone today expressed interest in following Jesus, how many of you would respond the way Jesus just did? I don't think very many of us would, all right? Jesus' approach to evangelism is very different from what we see going on around us today. Today, there's this view of becoming a Christian that's an emotional and even an impulsive decision. It's a feelings-induced act where people are led by fiery preaching and heart-rending stories and emotionally stirring music and the, and the goal of a lot of modern evangelistic strategies is to induce people to seize the moment, you know, get them to pray a prayer and, and make a decision to accept Jesus. But do you see that type of thing taking place in the, in the life and teaching and ministry of Jesus? He never tried to move people into an emotional moment of crisis so that they would accept him. There's no record in the New Testament of Jesus or the apostles counseling someone to make a a momentary choice or pray this prayer so that they can be saved. When the Lord invites someone to receive forgiveness and salvation in him, he didn't want it built on a moment's feeling of guilt or fear or even a desire for a better life but it was to be a carefully thought-out lifetime commitment to him as Lord. This guy cries out, you know, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, but the foxes, they've got their holes, and, and the birds, they've got their nests. I don't have anywhere I can lay my head. And I, I guess Jesus is, is seeing in this guy something we don't pick up a whole lot in our story, but was he ready to... To treasure Jesus above all the other comforts of life, above the comforts of home. Because remember, Jesus has just, in our text at least, literally just been denied a place to lay his head. Right there in Samaria. 
And he's letting him know there's not a lot of comfort, not a lot of glamour in following Jesus. Maybe Jesus is recognizing or noticing here that this self-denial is, is a, a struggle for this man. It seems he wasn't willing to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Jesus to Jerusalem. Now, think with me for a moment. Does this mean that we are not allowed to be comfortable as you sit in your heated church and your padded seats? Or to have homes? Are we not allowed to have homes? No, that's not what Jesus is saying, but it does mean that we must, we must never allow earthly things to get in the way of true discipleship. Jesus calls us to follow him where he went. That means to Jerusalem, to the cross. That means laying aside our earthly ambitions. It means letting go of creature comforts so that you can make a costly gift to the work of the gospel. For some, it will mean giving up the security of a home here in the comfort of the United States to go to the ends of the earth to bring the gospel. I pray that God would raise up more from this congregation to go. Let's keep going. Look at verses 59 and 60. Verse 59, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Again, when you hear this, it sounds kind of reasonable, right? But think about it this way. This man's first response was not to obey Jesus immediately. He goes, let me, let me, I'll follow you, but let me do something first. Instead, he, he's making an excuse of why he can't do it or can't do it right now. I was, I was thinking about this. This was me for the first 20 years of my life. I always thought someday I'll get right with God. Someday I'll do what God wants me to do. And God, thankfully, in his mercy, brought me to my knees earlier rather than later. We don't know this guy's situation here. It, it looks like that his father wasn't even dead yet. So how long is it going to be? Let me wait till my father's dead. And then when I, you know, I've gone through the, you know, our, my responsibility as a Jew of burying my father and all the process of that, then I'll follow you. I mean, this is basic family obligation. But what Jesus is teaching is the priority of the kingdom of him over even our own family. Let me ask you a question. Is he the priority over your family? Truly, or even the priority in your family. Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. He could see that this man was using his family situation as an excuse for delaying his discipleship. And I I think partly what we need to see here, or a reminder at least, is that sometimes what hinders us from following Jesus, it's not a bad thing or a sinful thing. Family is a good thing. Doing your responsibility, that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a good thing in itself that gets in the way of doing what God's really calling us to do. Jesus told this man to leave his family obligations in the hands of other relatives, letting the spiritually dead bury the naturally dead, while he himself was to go out and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. This man needed to see that his highest And most urgent duty was to follow Jesus. All right, let's look at the third man. Verses 61 and 62. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Once again, this sounds like a reasonable request, right? As a matter of common courtesy, that it would be appropriate for him to go back home and and say goodbye to everybody. Well, Jesus uses a proverb here from the fields to make his point. If we're going to plow in our field a straight row, which we would want to do, the way you do that is by looking at a a fixed point in the distance. Every time you look back, anybody done that when you're in in a car and you, you look off to the side, what happens? You know, you kind of go where you're looking. So you look back while you're plowing your field, and next thing you know is you're zigzagging all over the place. I don't know if if maybe this guy would have been tempted had he gone back home to just stay there. But he would have taken his eyes off of Jesus. Something else was, was first in this man's heart. And so Jesus told him, don't go back. 
Not even for a moment, but follow me right now. I like what one commentator that I was reading this week, he wrote this. He said, if we keep second-guessing our decision for Christ or looking back fondly on our old affections, or even worse, going back to the places where we used to sin, then we will never get anywhere with Jesus. If we want to be his disciples, we need to follow him without any further delay. That's a good word. The call to trust in and follow Jesus is to be like what Jesus was in verse 51, to have our face set to him. We may stumble, we may lose our resolve from time to time, but our face needs to be set in one direction, set right to Him to finish the course of following Him. So, let's think about this for a moment. Why would we choose that? Why would any rational person choose to deny themselves Take up their cross daily and follow Jesus. Well, I think Jesus summed it up well in Matthew 13, 44. Let me put it up here. He said this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You see, listen to me. The road of self-denial is not a road of loss for the Christian. It's the foolish person who gives up eternity in the presence of the King of Glory to try to hold on to something that won't last. We end up doing what C.S. Lewis said. We're like children who are content to make mud pies in the slum. We don't understand that there's been a vacation of the ocean offered to us. The one willing... To deny himself and follow Jesus is the one who has had his eyes open to the treasure of who Jesus is, the lasting treasure, the satisfying treasure. Many of you have heard of uh, a man named Hudson Taylor. How many of you all heard of Hudson Taylor? Yeah, most in here. Um, he was born in England in 1832, uh, died in 1905, but he came to, to Christ, to salvation in Christ as a young adult. By the time of his death, he had served the Lord for 40 years in China. He went where white people had never gone before. And while he was there, he faced xenophobia, that's kind of hatred of foreigners, uh, riotous crowds, natural disasters, political opposition, disease, and just on and on. During his, his years, he suffered greatly in his efforts to bring the gospel to people who had never heard about Jesus. While he was in his 30s, listen to me, he buried three of his own children and then the wife that he loved so dearly. And that that suffering shook him to his core, and yet he continued looking to Jesus. After one summer, he lost uh, two of his children and his wife in a single summer, and he wrote this to a friend. I'm going to put it up here. Mark should have it. So think about the context two children and his wife in one summer. He said, I I cannot describe to you my feelings. I don't understand them myself. I feel like a person stunned with a blow or recovering from a faint and as yet but partially conscious. But I would not have it otherwise. No, not a hair's breadth for my world. My father has ordered it so. Therefore, I know it is. It must be best. And I thank him for so ordering it. I feel utterly crushed and yet strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Oft times my heart is nigh to breaking, but with all I had almost said, I never knew what peace and happiness were before. So much have I enjoyed in the very sorrow. I could not have believed it possible that he could so have helped and comforted my poor heart. How is it that one man could endure such difficulty and such suffering? And really, and not merely endure it, but find peace and solace in the midst of it. What was his secret? Well, 
Good news, his son and daughter-in-law wrote a book called that, Hudson, Ta- Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secrets. Some of you have read it. I encourage you to if you have not. But let me put up here how they expressed his secret in that book. It's real short. Taylor had many secrets, for he was always going on with God, yet they were but one. The simple, profound secret of drawing for every need, temporal or spiritual, upon the fathomless wealth of of Christ. Hudson Taylor learned and experienced what the Apostle Paul wrote about in the book of Philippians. Let me put that up here as well. Philippians 4, 11 to 13, Paul writes this, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. For I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of Facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You see, the secret is simple. But the experience of it does not come accidentally or without pursuit, without effort. In fact, it's what this whole text we've just been looking at is about, without following Jesus. Let me read another quote from the book, Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Life. So again, this is his son and daughter-in-law. They wrote this. It was not easy for Mr. Taylor in his changeful life to make time for prayer and Bible study, but he knew that it was vital. Well do we remember traveling with him month after month in northern China by cart and wheelbarrow with the poorest of inns at night often with only one large room for coolies and travelers alike, they would screen off a corner for their father and another for themselves with curtains of some sort. And then after sleep at last had brought a a measure of quiet, they would hear a match struck and see the flicker of candlelight, which told that Mr. Taylor, however weary, was poring over the little Bible in two volumes always at hand. From 2 to 4 a.m. was the time he usually gave to prayer, the time when he could be most sure of being undisturbed to wait upon God. Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret was that he kept his eyes on Jesus. He did whatever it took to pursue him And it was only from that place of being in the presence of Jesus that he could be used by his king. That he could be, remember what our text said? The person who looks back isn't fit for the kingdom of God. That word fit means suitable or usable or of value. Without that firm resolve of looking to Jesus, we have no value, no fitness, no usefulness. For the kingdom of God. You you can't plow a straight line unless you're looking resolutely to Jesus Christ. So Hudson Taylor suffered a ton, lost a ton, endured a ton. But listen to me, he is not someone to be pitied. Rather, I think maybe his experience and his pursuit of the presence of Jesus is something that we should aspire toward. In his later years, toward the end of his life, he, a quote that many of you have heard from him as well as other missionaries, but he said this, I never made a sacrifice. Commenting on that quote, here's what his son wrote. I'll put it up here. I never made a sacrifice, but what he said was true. For the compensations were so real and lasting that he came to see that giving up is inevitably receiving when one is dealing heart to heart with God. Let's pray. Oh, God. This was maybe one of the more convicting passages that I've had to study and and preach in, in quite some time. I confess for myself that I have not pursued you the way I need to, the way you deserve. My eyes get so easily distracted. 
Help us, Lord. Help us to find the resolve of Jesus to set our faces resolutely to the cross, to our Savior, to his death, his resurrection, his ascension to glory. Thank you that Jesus is worth following. He is worth giving up things for, giving up our time, giving up our lives. Lord, help us to see the treasure of your Son, of who he is, all that he has for us. Father, I pray that you would raise up a church here that doesn't just do mighty works for you, but Lord, that is in love with you, that fixes our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to be in your presence. There's moms and dads in here who need to set their face toward Christ so they can be a blessing to their children. There's workers in here who need to fix their eyes on Christ so that they can be useful to you in their jobs. Father, we need you. So would you open, again, our our eyes and our hearts to receive you, to treasure you beyond anything in this world because you are worth it. Thank you for giving us your son that he would die, that we could be forgiven and given life in you forever. You are worth it, Lord, and we love you. And we pray in your son's name. Amen. Again, we have a couple elders, Carrie and Jason, in the back. And they would love a chance to pray with you, encourage you. If you're struggling, if you're sick, if you want to talk to them about your walk with Christ, your salvation, avail yourselves of those men. And let's sing together. Let's stand together.
We're going to be introducing a new song today. It's called God is For Us um, by City Light. So if you do not know it, we will teach it to you. Who can separate us? No one. No one. Before we head out, let me introduce the Turleys to you, if you folks would come on up here. We have Art and Cheryl and our three daughters. I think they can come on up too. Renee, Hazel, and Abby. They have uh, gone through the membership class, uh, interviewed with the elders, and uh, we are presenting them to this church family as our newest members, so please come welcome them at the end of the service. We are glad to have them here with us. And let me end with what we just sang. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, 
In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there's your answer. And in that and in him you are sent.